Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. All right. I like the enthusiasm. So uh, before we get started, we'll jump right in with three quick announcements. Hey, can I get the SGA election slide, please? Thank you, friends. So I'm Elena, um, I'm with SGA. Uh, so a few updates from SGA. We have two new at-large senators, Greg White and Amandre Street. So we're very excited to have them um, as senators now. But SGA elections are happening. If you haven't seen that, they're happening. Um, this slide has a lot of the information. So um, we're gonna be outside the CAF today with the election forms. So you fill that out, turn it into the Student Life Office by October 30th and then our elections and when we'll actually vote will be on Friday. It'll go out by Google form um, and then everyone will vote. Um, also, if you haven't picked up your planner yet, that will also be outside the CAF today. But please let me know or anyone else in SGA if you have any questions. Thanks guys. Just a quick reminder, those of you who signed up to pass out candy on Halloween, please come pick up your candy bags in the basement of the admin building, the Office of Student Life. Thank you. Hello. Good morning. We're the faces that you guys ignore at the Red Cross table. I'm Maddie, and this is Kate. Um, we just wanted to come up and remind you guys that we do have a drive coming up. She'll give you the date here in a second. but. Um, my uncle a few years ago uh, was actually internally bleeding and they did not know where it was coming from. He ended up getting 13 to 14 blood transfusions. And I think all of us know a story like that. So that is a perfect reason to get over your fears of needles because none of us like needles and to come out and donate blood for people like my uncle. Yes, the drive is Wednesday. Um, we have donation times from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m takes about an hour. Um, we would really like to see all of you out there. And thank you to everyone who has already signed up. We will have treats for you at lunch tomorrow. We'll have our table there if you want to sign up last minute. So see you later. Thank you. Before we get started, I am sensing a really good energy in the room. Positive attitude. That's great. I want to feel that from you. I do not want to hear that from you at the moment, though. So please be respectful. Remember that this is a space where we can all hear a lot of conversations that are going on. Uh, so please take this moment, quiet, put away your cell phones, be ready to be attentive and respectful. Appreciate it. Uh, to introduce our lecturer, our speaker this morning, uh, I will now welcome Kip Weedle to the stage. Back in 1991, our speaker this morning, Alan F. Weaver, was sitting where you are. He was a Bethel College student, and like you, he was contemplating life beyond college, wondering about future employment prospects, among other things. But he also knew that he was interested in a life of Christian service. So he went to seminary and later to grad school and eventually earned a PhD in theology at the University of Chicago. And he went to work for Mennonite Central Committee, a nonprofit relief development and peace organization with global reach. Alan has served MCC in a variety of capacities and for 11 years worked in the Middle East. Today, however, he is based in Pennsylvania and he serves as MCC's Director of Strategic Planning. His lecture this morning is titled Listening and Waiting MCC and Shifting Understandings of Christian Service, and it is the second of four lectures in Bethel College's 2019 Menno Simons Lecture Series. You can find more about MCC and more about the lecture series on the table out in the lobby. He'll be speaking again in this space at 7 p.m. this evening. Please join me in welcoming Alan to Bethel College.
so what is service what constitutes christian service a quick survey of the mennonite mennonite brethren and brethren in christ colleges and universities in the united states reveals the ubiquity of the word service in their mission statements not moving forward If we can advance the slide, that'd be great. Uh, Bethel College's new mission statement highlights that it prepares students for meaningful lives of work and service. Other Mennonite colleges promise in their mission statements to equip students to thrive in life, leadership, and service, or to serve and lead. The word service in these mission statements signals that a college education is not an end in itself that points students beyond themselves to work not only for one's own benefit or for the benefit of one's family, but also for the good of the church, one's community, and the broader world. Mennonite colleges are not unique in highlighting service in their mission statements. One finds other Christian colleges also using the vocabulary of service. Yet the prominent role words like service and serve play across Mennonite college mission statements is nevertheless striking. However else the value of a Mennonite college education might be measured, these mission statements suggest that potential metrics to assess the success of that education could be the number or percentage of graduates who live lives of service. But that, of course, simply begs the question, what is service, and what does it mean to serve the church and the world? To help answer these questions, I will leave behind the world of academia and its mission statements and focus instead on Mennonite Central Committee, or MCC. MCC is a Christian relief, development, and peace-building organization sponsored by several Mennonite, Mennonite Brethren, Brethren in Christ, and other Anabaptist churches in Canada and the United States. Founded in 1920 as an effort of Mennonites in the US and Canada to respond to the famine that was devastating Mennonite and other communities in South Russia, MCC today carries out program in more than 50 countries around the world. The notion of service has stood at the heart of MCC's self-identity for decades with the motto, service in the name of Christ, core to its identity. Yet at the same time, service has had multiple meanings across MCC's nearly century-long history. Or perhaps better put, the nature of service has been an ongoing point of contestation within MCC. In this lecture, I trace the shifting meanings of service across MCC's history, examining how MCC workers have critiqued and reimagined service. This lecture will also ask who we imagine when we think of people engaged in Christian service. Do we imagine MCC workers as white citizens of the United States and Canada, the descendants of German-speaking Mennonites from Europe, such as myself and many others whom I will be quoting in these lectures? How constrained and limited are our visions of Christian service? Questions like that will weave in and out of this lecture and my talks tonight and tomorrow night as I reflect on MCC's century of service in the name of Christ. From MCC's earliest years, one fundamental meaning of service within MCC has been service as discipleship, and more specifically, service as lived response to Jesus' command to his disciples in the Gospel of Matthew to give food to the hungry and water to the thirsty. Service from this vantage point is roughly synonymous with relief efforts to meet basic human needs. For many supporters of MCC today, this approach of, to service shapes their understanding of MCC's mission. Indeed, through the distribution of comforters, relief kits, canned meat, and more, a vital part of MCC from its beginning has been reaching out to the Christ whom we encounter in those who hunger and thirst, with the people who can meet, pack school kits, and fill relief buckets participating in that service effort. Whether responding to famine, devastating Mennonite communities in Russia through the operation of soup kitchens in the early 1920s, or distributing food aid and other resources to displaced peoples in Europe following World War II, or shipping MCC canned meat to North Korea, or providing relief buckets, comforters, and food parcels to hundreds of thousands of Syrians displaced by the Civil War today, a fundamental way that MCC has understood service in the name of Christ 
over the past century is as a response to Christ's call to meet basic human needs of neighbors near and far, including the neighbors that Americans and Canadians often view as enemies. Much of MCC's work during its first decades unfolded during or in the wake of world wars, with MCC functioning as a channel for the idealism of Mennonite youth who sought to make a self-sacrificial contribution to the global good parallel to the self-sacrificial actions of soldiers who had fought and died for their country. In a service application, Clayton Kratz, shown here, who led the initial MCC relief mission in the 1920s into Russia and who would then disappear, presumed dead, wrote in his service application that he wanted to help people in need because this great world catastrophe has not caused me any inconvenience. Young Mennonites like Kratz sought to be inconvenienced, to sacrifice like other young men of their generation had sacrificed. The ideal of self-sacrificial service was understood by many MCC workers as piecework, an act of testing and embodiment of Mennonite conviction of non-resistance, grounded in Jesus' call to his disciples to resist not evil, but instead to return evil with good. The Mennonite doctrine of non-resistance shifted from being the theological basis for separation from the world into a spur for vigorous engagement with it for demonstrating the power of active Christian love. An MCC document from the mid-1940s entitled The Why of Relief Work portrayed relief service during and after wartime as a form of real peace work. Such service, the author wrote, is a particular duty and privilege in a time of war when human sin and destructiveness are doing their worst. To build where others destroy, to heal where others kill, to love where all men hate is to heap coals of fire upon the head and to overcome evil with good. There is no greater force in the world than the power of Christian love and action. Relief work is living and powerful testimony to this love at a time when it is most needed. A decade later, MCC leader Peter Dick described MCC PAX workers in post-war Europe as Christian pacifist workers for others in the name of Christ, who forget self, thinking only of others, who are animated by a spiritual motivation, and who build bridges of understanding and goodwill between peoples and communions, not by lecturing or preaching, but through practical demonstration, through hard physical labor. MCC worker Dorothy Schwarzengruber expressed optimism in the power of love-filled service. Those of us who served on the foreign field know the effects of a love permeated service, she observed. In our contacts with people of other nations, other faiths, other customs, the folks whom we served through food and clothing distributions with the down and out, the folks whom we served through uh, with the, the bewildered refugees, the old people, helpless victims of a cruel war, it was obvious whether or not we were motivated by love. Service as a form of peace building for Pax man Roy Kaufman was incarnational with Pax workers embodying God's love and peace in their lives. Pax is not merely another movement or demonstration for peace, insisted Kaufman. Pax men are living examples for peace, demonstrating the love of God in heart and life. Meanwhile, John Suderman, a Pax man in Bielefeld, Germany, cautioned that the peace witness of service does not work immediately, and there is no promise that there will be no wars, but the cross indicates that love is suffering, rather, that love is rather suffering than victorious. Recognizing that young men entered Pax as an alternative to required military service, Pax administrators sought to foster a spirit of willing sacrifice among Pax men. Pax men are not drafted Christians, but rather willing second milers a PAX operations manual stressed. Robert Weiler, a PAX man in Enkenbach, Germany, told his supervisor that he and other MCC workers faced challenging questions from Europeans about what motivated their service. Do you do it because your government requires this from you? Or perhaps to see the other side of the world? Or are you here to really serve Christ and to feel that PAX is a tool for this purpose? Weiler expressed the hope that all PAX men could say that their service was carried out 
in a spirit of Christian love. Service through MCC also provided Mennonite women avenues for fulfilling this idealistic desire to demonstrate the power of active Christian love as well as the desire for adventure. Historian Lucille Marr found that by 1950, 40% of all MCC overseas workers were single women, nearly double the number of unattached men. Lydia Schlaba, who worked with MCC as a nurse in Korea in the 1950s, described her assignment as some glamour, some broadening of experience, some new learning, and lots of dedication and hard work. Some women spoke with pride about the connections they forged and the contributions they made in foreign cultures. Lois Martin, who served with PAX in Greece and Germany, and with PAX in Greece in the 1950s, lifted up the work of MCC women in service, comparing it favorably to the work of PAX men. Our fellows do wonderful work on construction of new houses, but haven't you heard of the MCC girls who help village girls construct and mend their clothing, she asked. PAX farmers help village farmers mix feeds and make silos, while lady PAXers acquaint village housewives with new recipes, she continued. As men discuss personal problems with men, so women discuss personal concerns with the women. Even as the civilian public service, voluntary service, PACs, and teachers abroad programs offered new vistas of global engagement for and by Mennonite women, service expectations and possibilities were significantly shaped by gender norms. My work must be congenial, my words pleasant and kind, and I must contribute my share toward a smooth and effective unit, explained Tina Workentine a so-called PAX matron who cooked, cleaned, and mended clothing for the so-called PAX boys. Always I must place Christ, others, in the work before self. To be sure, PAX men were also expected to live lives of self-sacrifice, but when applied to MCC women in service, the call to self-denial also reinforced a gendered hierarchy. Sometimes PAX matrons chafed at these norms, expressing the type of discontent that Betty Friedan would capture in the feminine mystique about the expectation that women would find fulfillment in housework. Reflecting on a long day of cooking and cleaning for the Pax men, Anne Drieger, Pax matron in Bechtedissen by Bielefeld, Germany, confessed, I do not feel satisfied and can't help wondering, is there really a purpose to my being here? Is making meals and scrubbing floors my sole purpose for being here? Continuing her musings, Dreger concluded that she could find meaning in the housework by viewing it not as wasted time and effort, but rather as a contribution to the church's witness that the wrong in the world can never be made right by force and bloodshed, and to a savior who teaches us to love all men and to do good unto them. Even as MCC service was understood as the active witness of non-resistant love and action, service during MCC's first half century also represented an alternative form of service to one's country. Through MCC civilian public service, PACs, and teachers abroad programs, Mennonites from the United States fulfilled a patriotic, patriotic obligation by contributing to the imagined good of their country. So, for example, MCC's executive committee declared in a September 1943 statement that the Mennonite men in civilian public service who fought fires, worked in mental hospitals, and carried out forestry and soil conservation activities were fulfilling a patriotic duty. CPS service, the board insisted, has meaning to the men who perform it as an expression of loyalty and love to their country and of the desire to make a contribution to its welfare. A decade later, in 1954, Omar Lapp, a Pax man in Bakdam, Germany, described his MCC service as fulfilling a patriotic duty. To be a patriot, Lapp explained, means to contribute the best we can to the welfare of our nation, and this is our active peace witness, rather than taking up arms. As the Cold War then began to take shape in the 1950s, some in MCC's PAX program presented Mennonite relief, not reconstruction and rehabilitation efforts in post-World War II Europe as contributing to the anti-communist cause. 
The PACS program, contended MCC Administrator Harry Martins, serves as a rebuke to those who are saying the Christian church does not care for a brother in need. This is a rebuke to communism that seems to find its way in where the Christian church has failed to do its part. Reflecting on the Pax unit in Northern Greece, um, MCC worker Dwight Wiebe claimed that an important objective of MCC's program in Greece was the demonstration of our peace witness in an area of international tension. The small mountain villages where Pax agricultural extension workers lived and worked, Wiebe explained, have always been a breeding ground and a no man's land for factions participating in the civil war. The need for removing the causes of communism is one of the greatest challenges confronting Christianity today. Removing the causes for war presents a great opportunity for our peace witness. To be sure, not all PAX men and other MCC workers understood their service as the fulfillment of a patriotic duty or as the reinforcement of the Western world's battle against communism. The editors of Canadian Mennonite, for example, viewed MCC's voluntary service program as the answer to the materialism and the militarism of our age. For PAX man Jim Youngke, who I think is here in the audience, PAX service expressed allegiance to God above country. As a Christian, I pledge prime allegiance to God, Youngke stressed, not to the flag of the United States of America, not to the St. Louis base Cardinal baseball team, and not to Colgate toothpaste. Such obedience, he continued, demanded non-resistant discipleship, which Yankee defined as complete obedience to God's will. Non-resistance, he stressed, was not passive or negative, but rather an outgoing of love and service to fellow men. Allegiance to God for Yankee not only stood higher than allegiance to country, allegiance to a militarized United States actively conflicted with allegiance to God. We speak glibly of the love of God in the United States, wrote Yankee. We print, in God we trust on our coins, but we don't trust God. We trust machine guns, ballistic missiles, and H-bombs. We trust in the $40 billion we give each year for defense. We believe that if it weren't for our armies, evil forces would overtake major portions of the world, so we pay our taxes and hide behind the flimsy protection they can buy. For Yankee, then, MCC service represented not so much an alternative form of patriotic duty, but rather an alternative to idolatrous militarism. I am a Pax man because I believe that Christ was telling the truth when he prepared the loving your enemies, when he proposed the loving your enemies and blessing them, the curse you was the way of God, Yankee confessed. I believe that the love of, God, the love of Christ is practical. Not only can this love work miracles within the heart of an individual, it is the answer to suspicion, fear, and mistrust, which usually ends in violence. Over the decades, MCC leaders have understood that MCC service assignments represented a form of proactive Christian witness. So, for example, MCC leaders in Canada in the 1950s describe MCC's voluntary service program as an avenue of a thorough and lasting witness of God's love for man in a hardened and indifferent society. Around the same time, PAX administrators stated that one of the program's purposes was to provide an opportunity for a positive Christian witness uh, by the individual in the unit. Through MCC service, an administrator observed, our young people have found unusual opportunities for a Christian witness to our Lord and Savior. As Paxmen sought to witness for peace as found in Jesus Christ and as he taught us through brotherly love. One popular form of witness in the Pax program was singing. Choruses of Pax men traveled around post-war Europe to share the good news, singing in churches, refugee camps, and prisons. Even as MCC leaders described its service programs as a form of witness, some of MCC's supporting churches became concerned that MCC service was being decoupled from evangelistic witness. Responding to these concerns, MCC convened a consultation in 1958 attended by representatives from several Mennonite churches and church agencies. At the consultation, Brethren in Christ church leader and chair of the MCC board, C.N. Hostetter, granted that there was a danger of an overemphasis on purely social service, adding that it was important that MCC's relief ministry in the name of Christ be more than a nominal cliche, concluding that 
unless our workers know Christ, give themselves to Christ as they give themselves for others and witness proactively for Christ, our program falls short as Christian relief. This concern about the potential separation of word and deed has surfaced repeatedly over the ensuing decades from multiple directions, with different Anabaptist churches worried about what they perceived as MCC's lack of verbal witness to the gospel. In my Tuesday evening lecture, I'll examine understandings of Christian mission and tension within MCC, offering one perspective on how word and deed have come together in MCC service over the decades. Even as service in MCC's early decades was viewed as a one-way response of discipleship from the US and Canada to the rest of the world, narratives within MCC complicated this unidirectional picture. MCC leaders Robert Kreider and Ron Matthies described MCC service as continuing education or transformative education, highlighting that the lifelong impact of those who went out in service was of as great, if not greater, an impact than anything they had accomplished while in service. One MCC administrator highlighted the educational character of MCC service, observing that MCC workers who have spent two or more years in an area of need and with a people in a different land and culture will not return the same as they went. To many of them, this is a school of hard knocks. They are away from comfortable homes, a land of plenty, and now living under very modest circumstances and day after day see human need and despair. Canadian Brethren in Christ leader E.J. Swalm also called attention to the transformative impact of MCC service. Surely we have noticed that many of these workers have forever had their pattern of lives changed. Once they have responded to a term of gratuitous service, whether it at home or abroad, they can never seem quite contented to do anything else. The editors of the Mennonite Church publication Youth's Christian Service made the same point in a slightly tongue-in-cheek manner, writing that, Mr. Paxman returns home with hatred for materialism and a passion for peace and justice. He feels he has a gleam of truth that daren't be lost, and he will try to put it across every chance he gets. The 1970s saw the start of a multi-decade creative ferment and rethinking within MCC about the nature of service. In 1976, for example, Urban Peachy, then MCC's Peace Section Executive Secretary and Middle East Director, penned a provocative article for MCC's internal publication, Intercom, entitled Service, Who Needs It? We've really done our best to send skilled personnel who can make a needed contribution, Peachy wrote. But now there are a number of countries which are interested in our aid, but not in our personnel. MCC should ask itself, he wrote, who is asking for this relationship? With whose needs are we primarily concerned? Was MCC concerned with the need of Anabaptists from Canada and the US to serve? Or with the self-identified priorities of churches and communities in the countries where MCC operated, which might not include the placement of North American workers? Such questions about what role, if any, service workers from Canada and the US might fruitfully play internationally became more pressing as countries around the world gained greater independence from former colonial powers and with the rise of a professional class and the growth and development of civil society organizations in those countries. These types of questions also gained in intensity as MCC moved from direct implementation of program to greater partnership with and accompaniment of local churches and civil society organizations. Beginning in the mid-1970s, service started to be redefined as learning. Responding to Peachy's 1976 intercom article, Atlee Beachy, a member of MCC's executive committee at the time, wondered that perhaps it is time to redefine the meaning of service, to recognize more fully the two-way dimension of service, including the notion that learning from others is an act of service. Such pondering was accompanied by active debates within MCC over the following decades about colonial and racialized assumptions about who is serving whom and where, with some visions of service critiqued for their implicit understandings of service as a unidirectional initiative of white Mennonites of European heritage to the rest of the world. 
reflecting back on these debates in the late 1990s, Judy Zimmerman Herr summarized these concerns in the form of questions. Does being in a giving posture demean those whom we send our help to? Is our service really an expression of power? How do we prevent our service from becoming an attitude of self-righteousness? As MCC workers in service, places like Atlanta, New Orleans, and Gulfport, Mississippi, encountered the stark reality of racism in the United States, they also began to highlight MCC's organizational whiteness and the racialized character of MCC's global service, with predominantly white Mennonites from Canada and the US going out to the primarily black and brown countries of the global south. Probing questions about service and power in the 70s and 80s led to a redefinition within MCC of service as learning and presence. So for example, Bertha Beachy, a longtime Mennonite worker in Somalia, wrote in 1978 that Christian service workers needed to adopt the stance of being eternal learners and to participate in the rhythm of people's lives. The redefinition of service as learning was crystallized in a 1986 review of MCC Africa's work led by Tim Lind. Africans have suffered under centuries of words and theories of change and development coming from the North, Lind observed. It is in this context that servanthood for us today means abandoning all of the good and useful things we have to say in Africa in favor of a listening stance. MCC workers from Canada and the US, Lind argued, needed to take a back seat and adopt a waiting posture. Revisioning service as listening and learning, Lind recognized, may seem to some less exciting and creative, particularly as it involves a shift in our thinking about ourselves as initiators and planners of activities and responders to need. However, he continued, we feel that this posture is in fact highly creative as it allows space and visibility to approaches to service and development, which are different from our Western approaches and which can mix with our own approaches in new and exciting ways. This reconceptualization in the 70s and 80s of service as a multi-directional movement of listening, learning, and sharing has shaped MCC programs up to the present. This new understanding of service was reflected in the name adopted by MCC when it, adopted, when it inaugurated an 11-month service program in the early 1980s for young adults from Canada and the US to the rest of the world, serving and learning together, or SALT. In later years, the Serving with Appalachian Peoples, or SWAP program, operated by MCC in Kentucky and West Virginia, changed its name to Sharing with Appalachian Peoples. Gene Snyder, an MCC worker in Jamaica in the mid-1980s, emphasized that without a learning stance, service work threatened to devolve into pointless activity. Unless we learn from the people themselves who they are and why, how they see themselves, the world, and God as they do, we have little to offer them but our busyness, she explained. And our busyness may, in the long run, have more relevance to our monthly reports than to the lives we touch. The heightened stress on service as learning generated intel intense self-reflection and soul-searching on the part of MCC workers, captured regularly in the form of free-form quarterly reports to MCC administrators, with some reflections shared within MCC's internal staff publication, Intercom, which ran for about two decades from the late 70s into the mid-1990s. Self-reflection sometimes became self-criticism about perceived failures or inabilities to become fully immersed in a new cultural setting. I've been a tourist for years, lamented Hilda Kurtz, an agricultural development worker in Kenya in the late 1980s. I want to live life, not watch it. I will always be a tourist here. I am weary of the role. Karen Kanegi, who served as an MCC community development worker in Bolivia in the mid-1980s, shared this lament. I know that some of my actions and possessions created walls and barriers between me and my Bolivian neighbors that kept us from truly understanding each other, Kanegi wrote upon completing her service term. I allowed my North American self to get in the way of forming more intimate relationships with Bolivians, and because of that, I was unable to be a more powerful witness to God's love. It also kept me from discovering the possibility of who I could truly be in the Bolivian setting. 
I was sensitive, loving, and understanding to a point. I went the first mile, but the second? How much did I allow God and the people around me to determine my identity in Bolivia? The past three or four decades have witnessed an expansion in MCC's understanding of who is engaged in service and where, and a redefinition of service as a sharing and exchange of gifts that builds on the strengths of local communities rather than focusing on helping them in their need. MCC US's summer service program, for example, has provided opportunities for young adults of color since 1983 to serve in their local communities. Meanwhile, beginning in 2004 and continuing up to the present, the Young Anabaptist Mennonite Exchange Network, or YAMAN, has operated in partnership with the Mennonite World Conference, offering 11-month opportunities for young adults outside of Canada and the US to serve in other parts of the majority world, opportunities through which the global church shares gifts of service with one another. The International Volunteer Exchange Program, or IVEP, initially established in 1950 to provide European Mennonites with one-year service opportunities in the U.S. and Canada, now includes participants from over 25 countries, and an increasing percentage of MCC's multi-year workers, including program administrators, come from outside of Canada and the U.S. The broader context within which, MCC, within which MCC service takes place are ever evolving. The number of young adults in MCC's South-South Exchange programs, Yaman, has almost doubled over the past five years, while the number of young adults from Canada and the US participating in MCC's one-year SALT program has dropped by about 20% in the same period. Increased restrictions on visas by many countries, including Canada and the US, present barriers to MCC's intercultural service programs. Organizations receiving expatriate MCC workers have greater expectations of those workers bringing professional and even specialized skills. MCC's short-term SALT program of 11 months appears to many prospective candidates as demanding a long-term commitment. Young adults in the U.S. today come out of university education with unprecedented levels of student debt and understandably seek service assignments that will fit within a career trajectory. The landscapes of Christian service are in dramatic flux. A key challenge for MCC as, a service, as an organization committed to service in the name of Christ will thus be discerning how to navigate the shifting landscape at the dawn of its second century. Thank you. We open it up to questions. I'm not sure if the electronic form has gone out yet. Do you have questions in the audience while we wait on that? We'll pass the mic around. you think of your questions, I'd be remiss. So it's shifting from dispassionate academic presentation mode into MCC recruiter mode. There is information about MCC's various service programs out on the MCC table in the lobby. Uh, we are always looking for um, new workers, um, including with our one year or 11 month SALT program. Um, my daughter just finished a year in El Salvador with the program and had a wonderful experience. So that's an anecdotal, um, um, impact report. Um, so feel free to pick up that information. A question submitted online was, as someone without a belief or affiliation to any religion, but a social work major devoted to a life being of service, what do you think about service without religious affiliation? Yeah, I mean, Jesus said, by, by their fruits you shall know them. So it's certainly the case that people who are not Christians, who don't have any religious um, affiliation, live lives of self-sacrifice, live lives of concern, 
um, and sharing of goods with other people. Um, and so want to affirm all peoples, whether they're Christians, Muslims, Hindus, atheists, agnostics, who live lives of self-sacrificial service. MCC does have uh, faith requirements, um, the, uh, the confession of Christian faith, a commitment to biblical peacemaking, and participation in a, um, some form of Christian community. Um, so that person wouldn't be able to uh, be an MCC worker, but blessings to them as they engage in service in whatever ways make sense to them. Hi, thank you for speaking. Um, can you tell us a little more about the SALT prog program and how we can get involved with it? Sure. Um, so SALT is an 11-month program running from orientation happens each year in August and then coming back in um, July. Um, I think that there are placements in certainly over 20 countries, probably 25 countries around the world. It's for young adults between the ages of 18 to 30. Um, there is, um, SALT participants are expected to raise around $5,500 to help offset part of their term of service. That said, um, if a participant would have trouble raising that amount of money, you should be in touch with your local MCC office. There's an MCC office just north of the campus here in North Newton, and there's information on the table also just about how to be in touch with people. Um, Michelle is right there. She can answer how to be in, how to get in touch with. Just people. walk across the athletic field to the building. I'm just pointing. I don't know if I'm pointing in the right. I don't know North South East. Michelle is our. Yeah. Well, well, she's figuring out directions. Go Michelle north. is our executive and director. And come over to the building, and we have information over there. I'm Michelle Armstrong. I'm the executive director for this regional Mennonite Central Committee. Um, some of you have been over to do meat canning, do quilt, tie comforters. It's that. It's that building. Um, and also, Linda asked the question. Uh, Linda Moyo, she's she is also on the board of MCC, and so she is also your representative as far as Bethel College. So awesome. you've got you've got a number of connections. Feel free to come over, walk over anytime. Lovely. The question is, what happened in the broader culture that led to this um, changing understanding of service? And that's a good question. Um, I was, I, I can't speak to a person, I, well, I was in my young ages, when I'm in the 70s, so I don't know that from personal experience. But yeah, that's an interesting thing to reflect on. One thing that I think it went hand in hand with, and I'll talk about this more in the Tuesday evening lecture, is it went hand in hand with a uh, broader um, dis disillusionment on the part of development agencies, whether those were Christian or non-Christian, with modernization theory and the hopes of like state-led development efforts um, to, um, in the majority world, to bring about tangible benefits. And so it, there was a shift away, not just within MCC, not just within Christian organizations, but also a shift towards um, saying we need to look at grassroots development, uh, development from the bottom up rather than from the state level downwards. That's one shift. Another shift that this is part of is it's a shift within mission discourse more broadly, uh, missiological discourse more broadly away from mission being from Europe and US, Canada, out to the rest of the world towards um, a, a more multi-directional understanding of mission with an understanding of the church participating in God's prior mission, or what's referred to often in the discourse as missio dei, God's mission of reconciling everything to the world and it not being an activity of the Western church to the rest of the world, but rather churches around the world participating in God's mission. I mean, those are at least two different things. I'm sure there'd be other factors as well. Do we have one more question? I would
would be interested in seeing visual representation throughout this hall of people who have been involved with MCC at some level. And you're saying raise your hand if you've or been involved with MCC, whether it's working for MCC or volunteering for MCC, like relief sales, not comforters, shopping at a thrift store, going to a relief sale, so quite a few. Yeah. Excellent. Were there were there other questions? I don't want to. I see you. Yes. Good. Hi. Thank you so much for speaking today. Um, so, in terms of the shift in service that you kind of talked about, um, do you feel like MCC uh, upholds these? Um, more closely than other Christian um, service organizations um, in terms of listening to people and their needs rather than um, imposing what you think should be done in terms of their needs? No, that, that's a very good question. Um, I mean, I don't have lived work experience with other organizations, so I'm hesitant to say, you know, to lift MCC up and say, yes, we're much better than all other organizations. But what is definitely the case is there's been ongoing internal self-critique within MCC, probably from its beginning, certainly over the past half century, of always asking the question anew about, about asking a variety of critical questions about service in terms of what's motivating our service, who is serving, are we listening or are we imposing? So at a minimum, I think MCC doesn't always avoid imposing, doesn't always avoid um, having service as an expression of power um, but um, it is always has that critical conversation um, circling within it. So that's something I would lift up on behalf of MCC. Additional questions? In that case, some of you may want to speak to Alan afterward. Feel, please feel free to come up. He has another lecture tonight in the same space at 7 p.m. Thank you very much. Enjoy your day.